But it would be nice to think that there were less, there was less suffering in the world because I lived rather than because I died. And I think if we all aim for that, we can do it together, but we just all need to do it, you know? We all need to start. <laughs>
And then the last minute, it all goes off like a mass brawl. Like, you're nearly getting your face smashed in. But luckily, like, you come away pretty unscathed, which is, you know, a touch word that, that was what happened for me. But um, then I've got to go home. Then I've got to think about trying to get to sleep. And my adrenaline's through the roof. Like, I just didn't sleep that night. Like, it's... Um, and that's that's just day-to-day life, really, sometimes. Mm. Crazy. Yeah. And I guess, like, say, people in your particular bar that you were working at they might not have seen the days and days before and then they deal with you on one night and they're like wow what's this guy so coming at me it's because you've because in being in, under that type of pressure it's like kind of like a police officer constantly have to deal with dangerous people and they they're a certain way to you and you're like why is this police officer such an asshole to me well it's because you don't see the weeks and weeks before what he's had to deal with exactly you just you need to act like the bigger animal basically you know, and yeah. there's a phrase when ignorance is mutual, confidence is king. And um, yeah, you do have to act like a bit of an a-hole. You have to. Yeah. And I suppose you can lose who you truly are in that world, you know, like you constantly building up these barriers and these walls and having these psychological battles with everyone and don't come at me because I'll come at you type of thing. So was that was the true good-hearted hench down there below somewhere or did you completely lose him i think so i mean my partner Gemma, she was with me through most of it and she says that i was you know that was there but i guess i would hide it <laughs> i guess i would hide it well yeah because that's a weakness isn't it and you don't want to show that in that type of world do you no you can't afford to you really can't yeah yeah, if they, people see a chink in your armour, then um, they're not going to take you seriously at the door, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, you know it. <laughs> yeah. So, like, obviously, become with being a doorman, you're going to be mi- mixing with different characters and go down further down the wrong track. Was there at any stage where you were like, oh, my God, this is... I've, I've hit rock bottom here. I, I don't want to do this anymore. Like, I know that there's probably a progression to that. But at some stage, there has to be some serious moment where you go, wow. Or were there, or were there mul- multiple serious moments like there was for me? The, the catalyst, catalyst actually was, uh, it was all in my mind. It was a dream I had. It was a dream. Um, the, where I work, Prince of Wales Road, real notorious violent street. And at one particular bar, a man came at a doorman like three times and the doorman shoved him back three times. At the third time, the guy fell over, cracked his head over and open on the pavement, sadly, and died. Uh, and he was on trial for manslaughter. And so this is on my mind. I'm thinking, oh, this happens to me every night. I have to push people away to create a safe reactionary gap so they can't just smash me in my face. And um, I just had this dream that um, I was standing at the Mercy nightclub where I worked. I dreamt that the policeman came up to me, slapped the cuffs on and said, that guy you hit last week, Paul, he's just died in hospital and you're coming with us. And I woke up and I, I didn't realise that it wasn't real. I thought that that had happened. My adrenaline was through the roof. And I, suddenly I realised, oh, now I'm in my bedroom. And that was it. I thought, what am I doing this for? Like, this is stupid. Like, why am I doing it? Yeah. Wow. Seems like you had a bit of an uh, epiphany moment there. Like, you, that dream, like, what was that? Your higher self talking to you or something like that? Like, Yeah, knowing what I know now, yeah, that's probably how I'd put it. Just puts things into wow. perspective. He wants to be in a cell... You know, he wants to spend their life like not being able to do what you want, and you know, there's there's no life, is it? There's no life. And the probability of that happening is very high. Like it's it's, huge. It's, it's huge. Well, if you're actually, if you if you're half decent at fighting, you know, you need to be accurate. Like uh, just a well placed punch on the jawline or whatever. The guy is unconscious. Then his whole body hits the floor, and then his head hits the floor with that kind of whiplash yeah. effect. People die very, very regularly like that. I've, I know, I've seen it even in Australia, um, and it's not the punch that kills them, it's when they're unconscious and they hit their head without any resistance. Yeah, and I've had people that I know doing 10 years for manslaughter for one punch, and when you're in that world, the punches happen all the time, daily, there's five a night, you know, there's people punching each other in the head all the time, but it just takes that one un- unlucky scenario, which you're increasing the probability for happening, and you, you being at the door... You, you're greatly increasing that probability of happening. So it's a very wise decision from your inner higher self there. And um, not many people get that 
that connection. So something about you that um, maybe there were bigger plans for you, Hench, and not inside a cell. I think so. Yeah, I really think so. I feel like, you know, I have a lot of regret. I did a lot of hor very horrible things. But I feel like having gone through that, you know, and I'd finished all work by then, but I became vegan. And, you know, I was known in the gym, you know, to be like a bit of a tough guy and whatever. And one day I came to the gym and I said, to everyone, well, I'm vegan now. And, you know, I didn't get any BS off of anyone. <laughs> and um, I think it just gave me some authority. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think people must have thought, well, if that guy, like, is as manly he, as he is and as strong as he is and as, you know, like, self-confident and everything, if he's saying, like, we can be vegan and still be muscly, like, there must be something to it. Or, oh, either that or they just didn't want to smack in the gob. <laughs> not, not that we're like that anymore, Joey, of course. Yeah, no, definitely. And uh, well, Hench gone vegan and listen to Hench. Oh, okay, no, don't get in his way. I'm actually glad he's vegan now. <laughs> I don't have to deal with him at the at the door anymore. So let's talk about um, you know, your vegan journey and you know was and the things in your past that led you there and how the hell do you, someone like you, make a connection to you know non-human animals when there would have had to be a big disconnect from human animals to be so high up in the world that you're in yeah so i'll be honest like initially uh i went vegan for the, the health reasons my partner Gemma, okay. she, she was looking at nutrition for health because she has an autoimmune thyroid disease and she found out like about whole foods plant-based diet and how it can prevent treat and reverse diseases and um you know i was looking at some of the data she was looking at and the, the china study the, the thing that really sold it to me was there was a graph of um most affluent countries on one side down to the poorest countries. And then the green lines were percentage of whole plant-based foods. So on the Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, it was nearly 100%. And down towards America was like 6%. And then the red lines were percentage of deaths from cancer, heart disease. And the affluent countries was, you know, right up there. Um, and, and then down to the left was virtually nothing. So complete inverse relationship. I was eating 500 grams of animal protein a day, thinking like the more animals I eat, the bigger and, you know, the quicker I'll get, like the, you know. I didn't even count plant protein. I probably had a really good whack of plant protein, but I thought it didn't count. Um, but just seeing this science, I thought, wow, I'm, I'm gonna kill myself tomorrow. Like I'm eating, I'm eating 500 grams of animal protein a day, like 42 pints of milk a week. Uh, 10 kilos of chicken, the steaks, the eggs, you know, the tuna, which I always hated anyway. Um, so I, I went vegan for, for health reasons. Or what, I should say I went whole foods plant-based for health, health reasons. <laughs> yeah, uh, true, yeah. And then it wasn't until a little while along, like several months, maybe even two years before I was exposed to the ethical side of things. I think accidentally I just came across, I think it was on Gary Yurovsky's site. You may, you may know this, Joey. Is there a video on his site where they're um, funneling cows down like a narrow sort of open corridor into the sort of house and they're like prodding them and the cow is really th thrashing, trying to turn around and you can see like the fear. Does that ring a bell? Um, there was a, a movie called Unity, and or was it Unity? And there was a, there's a scene where the cow... Yeah, that was in that movie also. Yeah, and I went, but I yeah. first I'd seen, I think I saw it on Gary's Adapt website. Yeah. But anyway, for the first time, I saw the fear. That cow knew what was about to happen and she didn't want it and she was frantic. And it, it devastated me. I was in pieces seeing that this intelligent, sentient, feeling being knew that her end was there. And like, it, it shocked me. I was in pieces and I felt, I felt so sorry for, you know, all the animals I'd ate when I didn't know better. I couldn't, yeah. it, it, it hit me like a ton of bricks. So from there, so I would say I went whole foods plant-based for health reasons, but having seen just that, I mean, it wasn't graphic. It, well, the cow was, was like, obviously they used a cattle prod, so that wasn't nice, but it wasn't, you know, visceral blood and guts, but it didn't need to be. I could just see that that animal did not want that and she wanted freedom and yeah. And so, I went whole foods plant based for my health, but I went vegan and became a voice for the animals just because I've done so much bad in my life, you know, again, when I didn't know better. Well, Hench, it seems that what happens to animals affects you on a very deep level. I can see you getting super emotional just talking about this cow getting led down the kill line. Um, you Have you cultivated this compassion or like from where you were? 
Well, let's just take it back to you being the doorman, getting in all these fights and building up this tough exterior. Do you think if you saw that cow going down the kill line, that would have angered you and upset you just the same? I don't know. I don't know. I I'm going to guess it would have done. I'm going to yeah. guess it would. I'll be honest now. I'll tell you a story which I'm really ashamed of. And um, I think it was to do with the amount of steroids I was doing, quite honestly. I, I feel really embarrassed to say this, but I, I, you know, I think honesty and openness and vulnerability is important. And I was in such a steroid-addled place, I bought a steak. And I always used to have my steak like well done because I didn't like to imagine it was an animal, I guess. I didn't want to yeah. see blood and I wanted to not think it was an animal, I suppose. But it was cooked wrong and I had and it was a rear steak and I was cutting into it and the blood was coming out. And I'm really ashamed to say this, but I actually enjoyed it. It made me feel like good, like like a big man. Like what's big about that? It's ridiculous, you know? It's disgusting. But I think that was just perhaps it was I did so much steroids. I was doing like thirty times the amount that you produce naturally. So you're gonna have some really bizarre, messed up psychology, aren't you? Basically. Yeah, well, testosterone especially, because testosterone, what is that? That's the, the what basically makes us a male. So if you're increasing, you know, that <laughs> hormone... I'm allowed to swear, Joey, on this podcast. Yeah. yeah, let's go for it. I will basically put it like, if something moved, I either wanted to fight it or fuck it. That, that's yeah. the truth of it. Yeah, that's really yeah, embarrassing no, to say. <laughs> well, you know, I bet around that world too, mate, and... Everyone was on steroids in that world, and it's just like you're dealing with some real, mate. They're like some lions out there. They they're gonna rip your face off, or they're going for each other's girlfriends, and it's just an all for all. And you know the violence, and the people have these. Um, they just go completely. They lose it. They lose it so easily because they're at this high level of you know, testosterone and like, they're looking at each other, come on, come on. So it's, it's, it's really, it's a really dangerous environment to be in. And I'd have people that were on, that were taking, uh, say, amphetamines, that were doing a no carb diet and they were on steroids and they were already a sociopath who was institutionalized. Now this combination here is a hammer in the face for saying nothing. <laughs> so, so it's like, I'm like, oh God, I can't say anything around this guy. He's going to kill me. So I, I totally understand what that, what that psychology is like. Now, people who haven't been there will just be like, well, I don't understand that. Well, I just want you to try to put, like, think of Hulk, the incredible Hulk when he's, this is what the, the testosterone can do to you. And then coupled with drugs and a stressful environment and a bunch of idiots around starting shit and dangerous people around and, all this drama, like that's the recipe for shit going down all the time. And uh, like, I totally know where you're coming from there. And you, I wouldn't be, look, the, the thing is when, when you say, um, you're ashamed that you, when you ate the bloody steak, it, you know, made you feel this way. Do you think it was anything to do with the programming towards men about steak being manly? You know, and you're thinking, wow, I must be like, yeah, this is it. This is what men do. They eat bloody steak or whatever. Yeah, exactly that. Yeah. I've not thought about it before, but you're spot on Joey. Yeah, you just yeah. played into that social stereotype BS. Yeah. yeah. Real yeah, men, do you know, what I've really learned is real men stand up for what's right and for justice. And they're, like you, they're not afraid of ridicule or attack. Like, you know, just out of insecurity, you know, we put on this front and oh, I eat meat, like oh, I'm a big, dangerous, like, guy. But it's all, it's out of insecurity. And if you're truly confident in yourself you don't need to do all that that's what i've learned you know well hence you're a very vulnerable guy and you just sat talking about that cow and you're just tearing out of your eyes do you think men don't want that to happen to them that's why they avoid it at all costs and just ridicule and go bacon though because they don't want to feel like you feel yeah because they're scared someone might attack them well you know i've been yeah. attacked enough times to know i don't need to really worry about that and um okay. yeah yeah spot on i think you hit the nail on the head yeah, and uh, do you think, like, a lot of men don't actually realise they're doing it? <laughs> like, it's just a subconscious, like, automatic thing? What is this phrase? I'm really fond of it. It's something like, most people are a biological robot having predictable reactions to external stimuli. So, yeah, exactly that. Like, they don't even, yeah, they don't know they're doing it. and uh, But that's so obvious. It's, it just boggles the mind. <laughs> that's crazy. And let's just... 
go from like you're saying about like not being afraid to be ridiculed and like we both know how hard it is to build up this tough exterior, this say this huge ego to do with the world that we're in. And you said 12 years. Now, I was involved with stuff from 14 to about, you know, 26, about 12 years as well. And, you know, you create a character. Like, this is the character you've created to deal with that world. And when you leave that type of world and go vegan, you're basically breaking everything down and building it back up from the ground up. Can you explain that process? Because <laughs> that's a big process. 12 years is a long time. I don't really recall. It sort of feels like I've always been this like vegan, like positive like yeah. advocate. So it feels like a totally different lifetime, like someone else's life. I can't really remember the interim, to be honest. I just sort of had this epiphany one day. I remember seeing Earthling Ed and he said something, I think it's a Tolstoy quote, while there are slaughterhouses there will always be battlefields and i thought yeah. that's that's a nice that's a nice sort of sentiment but i don't know whether that's true or not but then just one day i sort of applied it to me and i just thought if i don't want to harm a chicken i never met if someone's like rude or aggressive to me and i'd finished working the doors then so i wasn't in that dangerous sort of situation anymore it's what if someone's rude to me like probably they're having a bad day so they're suffering their suffering is spilling over they're not giving it to me i can either like smash them in the face and then you know there's negative outcomes for them and potentially their family and potentially for me if you know the police get involved or if it goes like really bad and um i just thought can i just step out of my ego long enough if i don't want to harm a chicken i've never met someone's rude to me can i just step out of my ego long enough to not slap them to not rear up at them to know that they're suffering and to forgive them for that. And hopefully it doesn't like then pass on. And just life is like a hundred times sweeter when you act in that way. Not always easy when you get constant trolls, etc. But by and large, I manage it and um, just feel so much happier. So rather than reacting to external stimuli like a brown, brain dead robot, it's uh, breathing, taking a minute and responding. And the response could be that you just ignore it. Like, yeah. or I'll say thank you for your perspective, but won't engage in an argument, and then I'll just leave it. And oh, I, I don't need other people to agree with every single thing I say and do. Like, it doesn't matter, does it? You know, as long as we're happy within ourselves, what we're doing. Seems like you're a confident guy. It takes more confidence and more strength, I feel, to not you know, act like that, you know? I know. Um, We're told that as kids, aren't we? We're told that as kids, and I never believed it. I never believed it. I thought, no, it's just because they're a wimp. But actually, no, it is. There's a lot of wisdom in Oh, God. It's strength, trust me. Some people, God, and they, they, I think some people, there are a small percentage of people that actually deserve a whack in the head every now and then. But to, 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 have, to have the strength to not act on that and go, you know what? They're suffering too. Like... They're going to walk into some, some karma down the road. If they keep acting like this, they'll get their lesson. It doesn't have to come from me. That takes a lot of strength because like 12 years of just reacting and, you know, boom, making sure that you weren't the victim and, you know, overcompensating to going, have the strength and let them go. That, that takes a lot of evolution of self and letting go of your ego that you built up for a long time. So It didn't take that long. It was just really finding veganism. It really was. Wow. It was ninety percent just finding veganism and thinking of others rather than just thinking of myself. And then another little bit was I, I don't do it now. I, I don't make the time, and I should. It's to my detriment. But meditation as well, just being able to take yourself out of the moment, observe yourself in the situation, and again respond rather than react. That's that's very helpful. And I don't do it enough. I really don't. Yeah, I'm meditating. Well, me too. I, you know, sometimes I'm getting in the thick of things, and I stick a table out in a bad bad area in the middle of the city and I've got people yelling at me gonna stab me and this and that and I start getting revved up and I start thinking okay so and then that's coming across in my my conversation and I'm like well I'm not really not as in control of this conversation as I could be because I'm not in control of my emotional state because I'm in a dangerous environment and my old traumas are coming up and I'm getting a little bit like you know getting ready to square up or something but I'm trying to have a conversation and everyone's watching and I'm like hard to you know, concentrate this. at that point yeah, my yeah, hat's off to you, yeah. Joey. My hat is off to you. Yeah, it's a difficult situation to be in, especially when you think, well, 
the dangers that we've experienced, they, they do come back like that, that emotion, residual emotion comes back because you're like, well, this is how I dealt with it back then. So it is a little bit hard to escape it completely, although you can like target it and work on it. And you said you use meditation and also like you're exercising a lot. You train every single day. You're very dedicated and you're doing all these martial arts and all those things. How big is what you do in terms of your exercise and weightlifting um, for your mental health? How big is that? Do you know, I don't really notice these days, but I do, I know years ago when I was, you know, in these dangerous situations, things like bag work and pad work and sparring, like they were invaluable. They helped sort of keep my equilibrium. Yeah, that used to be huge. But um, yeah, I'm at such an even keel nearly all the time now. I can't really, I can't really say, I can't really say. Yeah, it seems like you've been doing it for that so long. It's just a normal feeling and if you stop doing it that's when you would kind of start noticing it so let's go let's go into like um how and why you started speaking up you know online because that's when you're being exposed to a larger audience that takes a tougher sort of you know mental state to to push that out there so how did that start well initially with the it was with youtube and um quite simply i was a pt i was a vegan pt and, um, you know, I would tell my clients, you know, what sorts of things to eat and where do you get your protein and blah, blah, blah. But, they, you know, they would never really take it in and they keep asking me the same old thing over and over. So I thought, well, I'll just make a resource. I, I'd heard of YouTube. I didn't really watch it that much at the time. Um, but I thought I'll just make some resources on there for them and then they can go there. I had no um, plans whatsoever to be a YouTube. I never would have imagined I could be one because I was so like self-conscious, you know, as a lad, I, I did a, like a radio interview and uh, I got all self-conscious and went bright red and didn't know what to say. And that kind of informed me into adulthood. Oh, you can't do like recordings and radio and TV, like you, you, you know, you're, you're self-conscious. And so, um, I never had any plans of that being a thing, but just gradually exposure therapy, like when I worked the doors and I, because I was scared of fighting actually when I started working the doors, which is why I started because I was teaching martial arts and thinking, well, if I'm not been in fights and I can't pressure test it, or um, how can I speak with authority on self-protection if I'm not living it? Also, like looking at your channel, you've got a lot of health um, stuff on there and you now, you're now you doing a lot of uh, response videos too and you do, you're do you dropping the um, animal rights truth bombs in there as well. You've got a real mixture there of like e eating videos, training videos, diet um, recommendations, um, animal rights, content and you're doing these response videos as well now you, you're very diverse in in your approach and what you're doing is there a reason for that yeah i'm making the sort of content that i want to make the kind of inspirational motivational educational stuff to inspire people to be vegan and to show them how to do it healthfully um but also i'm very conscious that drama sells and so these type of videos very like often don't do all that well and then the minute I respond to you know like a very of Frank Tofano Joe Rogan particularly the larger you know the person that you're critiquing the bigger the video blows up so I see that as a sort of a means to an end I don't really want to do that sort of content because I feel although it's from a positive place that I want to help animals and people in the planet I see it as sort of negative because it is like attacking I tried to do it in a as good a way as possible. And certainly when I first started, I did it in the wrong way and was quite sort of rude to the person. Again, that was from a place of knowing the game and want to create drama to get views. But then I saw, now I don't need to attack the person. I need to attack the message, you know. I don't need to say like, you're stupid. I need to say this message is stupid and here's why, here's 12 studies like proving otherwise, you know. So it's finding that balance. But obviously someone does need to stand up to you know, the ex-vegans who simply had a horrendous diet, didn't take B12, did crazy extremes, fasting, and then they blame veganism instead of their application or their poor application of the diet. You know, we just need to put people straight so they are informed and they, they know what's going on, you know? Yeah. I've watched your response videos. I love your response videos. You do have a good balance there. I think you're a bit hard on yourself because there's a lot harsher people out there than you. And I'd prefer to get Hench yelling at me than, you know, some of the other people or Joey sometimes. I can be a bit. <laughs> but 
you know, you know, this is like what you're doing is you really you you found work that is consistent with your purpose. So if it's purpose driven, you're trying to find the best way to get that message out to people. And YouTube is YouTube. You gotta you gotta play the game on there. If you don't, you get swallowed up and no one knows who you are. So I really appreciate you saying that, and that means a lot to me. And again, it, it is from a place of love rather than from a place of hate. Like, what is one of the strangest excuses you've heard? Because I've seen you responding to some of these carnivores and stuff. I've They've got some bizarre, very bizarre points of view. Like, um, they making up certain nutrients, um, you know, very bizarre ethical arguments, um, weird character attacks they pull. They think every vegan has got crazy eyes and they're, um, you know, they're, dissolving in front of everyone and dying of deficiencies. The main thing that makes me laugh is when I get accused of uh, being nutrient deficient and malnourished. And the guy, you know, in the avatar, the guy is either half my size or he's, you know, he doesn't want to show who he is. He's just a decapitated, you know, head on some shoulders and a blue background. Hench herbivore malnourished, that's, that's crazy that people will look at you and be so biased that they will still look at you and go, you're malnourished and you're a nutritionist and you're planning your diet and you've put up your chronometer and you're hitting all of your recommendations. And then when you ask someone like that, you go, hey, like, so do you track your nutrients? And they go, no. Well, how do you know that you're not def deficient eating meat, dairy and eggs? I mean, deficiencies are rampant in all, can be can, can happen in all diets uh, trends if, you're not, if you don't plan them correctly. If we look at the data, I think uh, James Wilkes brought this up, you know, the Game Changers director and the, the yeah. late, um, sorry, producer. And then the latest stats were vegans on average, because most vegans don't eat a healthful diet, tend to be deficient in seven nutrients, omnivores, nine nutrients. So on average, you know, an average omnivore is more nutritionally deficient than we are. Like, yeah, you can be deficient in all diets, right? There's some things that an omnivorous diet has that vegan diets don't have. What are those things? Because people like to talk about what vegan diets lack. This is what I really like to talk about. Like, yes, you can do a vegan diet poorly, but at least you can do a vegan diet well. What well, whole foods, plant-based, supplement those couple of things. No one's dying of deficiencies. Everyone is dying of excesses. Cholesterol, trans fats, sat fat. These are all found in meat. You know, choline, which there was a big rumpus about recently. Some editorial wasn't even a nutritionist. And yes, vegan diets on average do have less choline. But actually, we don't know the RDA for choline. The RDA is just an arbitrary number based on a sick population. It's just an average of what most people get. Uh, and now there is plenty of choline in grains, in legumes, the sort of things that should be staples. An excess of choline feeds pathogenic gut bacteria, what we call the bacteroides strains. Um, they, they eat the, the choline, they make trimethylamine. This oxidizes in the, in the liver, creates trimethylamine oxide. It's known as the molecule from hell. So not only are we eating the you know, free animals, trans fat, sat fat and cholesterol, that cause atherosclerosis, the number one killer of humans. You know, every time we eat these foods, you know, our, our coronary arteries and all our blood vessels are getting constricted. Not only does it have those, but it also has the choline. Now, choline accelerates atherosclerotic deposition and it makes it harder for your body to clear um, cholesterol out of the bloodstream. So if you want to die like as early as possible, you know, just eat more like eggs with like really high choline. Like choline is the last thing you want to be really emphasising. So it's always been crazy to me, Hench, how like when you eat animal products, animal products are inherently cruel and abusive and to eat to eat them knowingly would mean that, you know, you're not showing much compassion and a bit cold hearted if you've seen the animal suffering and continue to eat these products. Isn't it crazy that the first thing that eating these products attacks is the human heart and the number one killer of human beings over everything, over anything? in the world is heart disease. Isn't that like a crazy connection? It's like instant karma, isn't it? Well, sadly, decades long karma because it takes a while to present, sadly, and people just don't know. 
I think that there's a there's a rule 40 over 40 40 percent of males over 40 will get erectile dysfunction we used to think it was psychosomatic we now know it's the penile artery getting fed up with atherosclerosis because that artery is a lot smaller than your coronary artery so if men if you're very very lucky you, you, your dick may stop working and that'll be a warning to you you need to stop eating animals or that's going to happen to your heart next yeah they call it the canary in the coal mine don't they the canary in the coal mine the warning before you know that, the canary in the coal mines, you know, where they used to bring a like a canary in a cage down into the coal mine, and then if the canary died, they, yeah, they knew that there was some type of poisonous gas. So, the canary in the coal mine, coal mine for heart disease is erectile dysfunction. If those arteries stop start clogging up, you might, you know, atherosclerosis anywhere is athros, atherosclerosis everywhere, isn't it? If so many diseases that we think. Oh, that's old age or whatever. Like, well, we now know from our research, Joey, that it's atherosclerosis, like, so that's heart disease in the brain, that's stroke, can be erectile dysfunction. More and more and more, we're finding out that a lot of the things that go wrong are because of atherosclerosis. When, um, so my eyesight is more than twice as strong as when I first went vegan. Um, that story made the Daily Mail, and then I shared that on my social media, and just droves of other vegans said, me too, me too. When I went vegan, my eyesight like improved. And do you think that's got to do with the, the veins in your eyes yeah. and blood flow I think in like your eyes? The capillaries that feed the eyeballs. So, you know, if yeah. a big old artery, um, you know, can get fed up, well, these are going to be fed up a lot sooner. Um, and nerves as well, I think. Is it multiple sclerosis? Um, yeah, the same thing. Yeah. Like the, 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 the capillaries feed the nerves get fed now oxygen nutrients not getting through so many diseases i think are atherosclerosis and i think we're going to discover more as time goes on now do vegans have to be careful of heart disease yeah it's, it's the top killer of vegans also so this is where i like to make the distinction whole foods plant-based or whole foods vegan versus vegan vegan tells me that you're a good person that you actually put animals you know you, you think about them and you don't want to hurt them but it tells me, it just tells me what you don't eat. It doesn't tell me, you know, you may be eating Oreos, you may be drinking beer, you may be eating donuts, crisps. That's going to have a much different health outcome than kale, quinoa and say berries, you know. Yeah, definitely. And a whole foods diet doesn't tell us what your philosophical belief towards animals is either, <laughs> you know, because you could still be, you could eat a whole foods uh, diet and you could be constantly buying leather, going to the circus, uh, buying off dog breeders and, you know, doing all these external things that harm animals as well because you don't have that moral principle. So I think it's good to distinguish between the diet and the philosophy. So you could go, okay, well, I eat a whole foods plant-based diet, but I'm a vegan by my philosophy. And if you don't mention that, you're just a vegan by your philosophy and, you know, you just eat whatever the moderate diet you eat. Um, but yeah, there's uh, saturated fat rich plant foods and, you know, you got like palm oil and coconut oil and, you know, refined um, oils as well can damage the arteries. And the worst ones, I like you say palm oil, coconut oil, cocoa butter as well. So the, the fat inside cocoa beans, mm. so chocolates, yeah. um, cocoa nibs, cocoa beans or cacao nibs, cacao beans. But cocoa powder or cacao powder... I think I've heard it said that it's the one processed food that's healthier than the whole food because they take out these long chain triglycerides, but you are left with all the great minerals, not magnesium and stuff like that. So if you want some chocolate, use cocoa powder or cacao powder in your cooking black bean brownies, chocolate data aid, chocolate, you know, plant based yeah. milkshakes and things. You can still have it like energy balls, but go with the powder rather than the whole bean or, or the nibs. Yeah. Yeah, if you're super concerned about your health, and but if you want to go hard one night and go for chocolate, if it keeps you off the dairy chocolate, please go for the vegan chocolate. <laughs> yeah, like you say, Joe, the animals don't care as long as we're not eating them. So, do you know what I mean? I don't mind what people eat. I like to educate and I like to put it, give people the power, the knowledge to know, yeah. you know, so they can make an informed decision. Exactly. And if you want to live a long, healthy life, um, to help the animals, then I would definitely go more of the hench style of eating if if that's what you're concerned with. For, for an activist or an advocate, oftentimes it's not the message, but the messenger. And if we're like, you know, like terribly overweight or terribly, terribly underweight or just, you know, sickly, you know, that's, that's not a good example. So I would say to people, if you are vegan, like you deserve a long, happy, healthy life because you're a good person. And if you want to save animals, 
perhaps it's just worth considering just from that perspective to eat a bit better to be a better advocate you know not that it, i mean that's very shallow and it shouldn't be that way but sadly this is how people think so sometimes the message the message is taken better if the messenger is credible so like and many things fall under the category of credible but also like you know what's credible for one person might not be credible for another and what builds rapport with one person might not build rapport for another but being a good strong healthy example uh for a vegan or even as an animal rights activist definitely helps even if it's in their subconscious they see that which is why i got into training for a while there but i fell back off the wagon i need to get back on that wagon i hope you're gonna sort that out after today's conversation young jerry i've got my eye yeah. on you yeah, I will. I'm going to have to because it's really important for my mental health and, you know, my physical health obviously falls under that category too. It just it echoes throughout your mental health. But you're, you've been in good shape for a long time, so you probably just, it's just the norm for you. Yeah, sure. Now, Hench, from, from from my point of view, you're like, you've got to reach more of the, like, for, well, women as well, but I think you're more, you're more a man's kind of guy, you know what I mean? Like, and the... The men are the hardest to reach. I mean, the vegan movement is it's about 75% women. Yes. Men are harder to reach with this message. What is some of your advice for someone who's a guy watching, they're not yet vegan, or they, they're worried about what their mates think, and they, they're worried about caring for animals, or you know what, what the stigma that might come with that? What do you say to someone who is looking up to you for a bit of advice? I would say, man the hell up. <laughs> man the hell up. Are you a leader or a follower? The world will be predominantly vegan one day, I am convinced of. I don't know how long it's going to take a while, but it will be the overwhelming paradigm. And do you want to be the hundredth monkey? Do you want to be the last person who, like, makes the right choice, You follow, follows ahead? Or do you want to be one of the lead animals that breaks off and people are, are following you, you know? Man up. <laughs> People do care what others think, though, especially young men, don't they, Hench? And there's a lot of social pressure, peer pressure. You know, they're afraid of being ridiculed. So your message is, if like if they're, what they're doing is right, they should have more strength of character to stand up for what uh, what's right. Because it kind of it to stand up for what's right in a world full of ridicule makes you the stronger person. It takes more courage. The most manly thing I ever saw, so my friend Barney Duplessis, he was the reigning Mr. Universe 2014. I met him in 2015. Sorry, he, he won 2014. Met him in 2015. He's the reigning Mr. Universe. And he said to me, we became training partners. He went vegan off of a chat we had. He became training partners. And he said to me, I would be willing to die for a cause I believe in. And I thought, Wow. That's some that's some big words, but that's words. And then I saw him <laughs> about six months later. He was competing at the pro uh, universe, and we were in this huge auditorium. I was about the smallest guy in there. <laughs> Everyone was a huge, you know, steroids monster. Um, and he's on stage, and and they've all competed, and the judges are deliberating, and it just took. They, they were struggling to form a decision and it was going on and on. So the MC decided to do a little interview with all the bodybuilders. He went to him one by one, asked how the prep went, etc. In front of a huge auditorium full of huge meat-eating steroid monsters, my friend said, oh, yeah, well, I, I, went, vegan for, uh, I went vegan for this prep. Uh, Plant-based gains, he said. And he threw up like a, a V sign. And there was... Six or seven little snickers, and then there was some cheering and some clapping, yeah. and I thought, that was, excuse my French, that was fucking brave. That was, And I, yeah. I do believe that he would be willing to die for what he believed in, because yeah. I don't think I would have had the balls at that point to have done that. That was a yeah. brave, brave thing. Very brave, very courageous to do that, and especially in a setting like that. So I guess the message is to the younger guys is that, uh, you know, it, like, just go for it, mate. Just stand up for what you're believing. And if you, if your mates aren't friends with you for that, like, then maybe they're not the right, you know, people to be around anyway. Like, you know, you're going to find a new tribe and you're going to find people that respect you for speaking the truth. Now, no one really respects someone who follows the crowd and, you know, like, really, like, you know, if you speak your truth and you don't give a shit what other people think about it, you know, obviously there's still respect that should be had, you know, when... when 
kept in mind when you're doing it. But if you don't give a shit and you speak your truth, people are going to be drawn to you. People are going to say, wow, this guy's got courage and a backbone. And not everyone, not everyone, but don't worry about them. But people are, trust me. And that's how, how, how it works, yeah? Yeah, spot on. So, Hench Boy, thanks for coming on the show today. I really appreciate your time and thanks for all the work you do speaking up on your platform and you, you really have, you know, grown a lot over the years and, you know, very research-based. You, you, you get the animal message in there and your response videos are epic and thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate it a lot. Think about this. The world's in a big crisis right now. Um, you know, we've got all this stuff going on with the coronavirus and everyone's sort of at their home and they're in a bit of fear and, you know, they might still be, you know, consuming animal products which are full of fear or they might be a little bit concerned about the future. Like, there's a bunch of vegans that are at home as well and they might need a bit of motivation. There's all these things going on in, in the world. Like, what can keep them going? What can, um, you know, what could inspire people to change their life right now? Like, how do you navigate through your life? Like, obviously, you don't always use your mind there's things that you do from your heart, you know what I mean? What I've really learned about life is to be really happy, you need to live a life of purpose. And there's no greater purpose than saving people's health so they can live a long, happy, healthy life they can be around for their children. Saving animals, you know, I know we don't like to look at it, but all the time animals are screaming for their lives. You know, and the planet is screwed. Like if we don't change yesterday, you know, the planet is screwed. And, you know, this COVID-19, it came about, don't believe all the BS, it came about because we mess with animals. You know, we wouldn't even have the common cold or flu now if it wasn't for domesticating animals back in the day. 75% of zoonotic diseases, you know, come from messing with animals. We need to all go vegan for everyone's sake. If you're struggling at home, on your own just get some purpose do some training get yourself a little routine of cardio if you're really overweight just start with some walking and build up you know if you're not done resistance training do some press-ups do some pull-ups you know do some crunches develop a, a, a good body and just just try to put out positive whether you know just on social media just certain posts sharing meals sharing documentaries you know the the world hasn't got time for half measures and we need to do all that we can now. If you, you know, if you want this world to carry on, if you want to save animals, don't just sit there all glum and depressed. The answer to depression is to do something positive, is to be altruistic, think of others, you know, and be of service. And so that's my, my thing. I've just found, rather than trying to take from the world and being this fear-based like individual, trying to put others down and make myself feel good. No, I found by helping others up, that makes you feel the best and altruism is really the nicest feeling and it would be nice to think that i ate a lot of animals but it would be nice to think that there were less there was less suffering in the world because i lived rather than because i died and i think if we all aim for that we can do it together but we just all need to do it you know we all need to start oh that was absolutely beautiful hench thanks so much mate you absolutely nailed that Thanks so much for coming on, mate. And everyone, go check out Hench Herbivore's channel. Guy's amazing. He's a legend. He's been through a lot in his life, and he's sharing so much of the positive um, stuff. He's really making a, a huge impact. So thanks for existing, Hench. You're a legend, and keep up the good work. Joey Cobstrong, right back at you, brother. All those things times 10. You're amazing. And when this, when this lockdown's over, I want a big Joey cuddle when I see you. Of course. I've no. got one warmed up just for you, mate. Yes. <laughs> All right, brother. Sweet. Okay.